Jack Rupel from Argyll, Minnesota originally. Now I live in Florida, retired. I was drafted August 28th, 1969. And went to Fargo. I had bad knees from playing football and I didn't think I would get drafted, which I did. They sent me to Fort Lewis by train. I had the whole train, and they put the caboose, then they put us. And they'd bring us a sack of lunch, and that's what you got to eat for the day. But you got it. Yeah, we were fit enough. But when we hit Fort Lewis, it took us three and a half days to get there. Um, we were pretty hungry, and it was a whole different experience. Because everybody that was on there was from Stephen, Argel, Warren, Strenquist, New Folden, up in our neck of the woods. So we were all in the same kind of boat, all a little uh, scared, I was suppose you could say. Hadn't been that far. Back, back then, you didn't just go to the big city too often. But uh, we all ended up taking basic in Fort Lewis, Washington. I, one thing I do remember about Fort Lewis was I was there from August 31st to October 31st. I left on Halloween and there was only two days that it, it didn't rain. It rained every day. We'd march down to the Pusic Sound, we'd march back. We'd run here, we'd run there. Um, I was a lucky one. I was in pretty good shape, so I come out of basic as an e, E2. Then they shipped me to, I didn't get to come home, they shipped me to Fort Belvedere in uh, Washington, D.C., about 12 miles out of D.C. to the west. And I took up uh, operator mechanic of generators. So I was pretty sure I was going to Vietnam. We stayed there. Uh, I did a lot of sightseeing into Washington and uh, made good friends. Ended up where uh, they put 200 of us in line, time for graduation, and they picked five of us and give us, uh, I got a, uh, a winter coat. And I said, I mustn't be going to Vietnam, they wouldn't give me a winter coat. And the guy next to me he said, you're lucky, you're lucky. I didn't get a winter coat. <laughs> Five of us left and we got to go home for six days. Then I went to Fort Dix and from Fort Dix I went to uh, Germany. I uh, landed in Frankfurt, from Frankfurt at 2 in the morning, they put me on a bus and they hauled me over to uh, Heilbronn, the 127th uh, Engineer Battalion. I didn't know what I was doing there, but I was there. There's nobody to tell you where to go. It was Hitler's old barracks. And after a week, somebody found me and said, you got to check in at all these places. You got to check into Battalion A and all these different places. So I started checking in, and there was a spot that was called the hole. You went down in the ground about 10 feet, and you had to get through there, get checked in. And I got in there, and there's people with um, weapons, loaded weapons, at the gate. You go through, it's a tight little group, and some E7 meets you, talks to you, and says, do you think you'd like to be here? Well, I asked, what do you do? And he says, can't tell you that, it's secret. But he says, to get checked in, you have to read this manual a little bit, and we come in, and they give me a book, and they said, you go in the room, you read these eight pages, and we'll come in and talk to you. So I went in the room, read my eight pages, Come in, he had 10 questions, I answered all the questions, right? He says, would you like to belong to this organization? I said, well, what do you do? We don't build bridges and we don't go out in the field. I said, I think I'd like to belong to this organization because there's snow on the ground outside. <laughs> I don't want to sleep in the tent no more. 
So I learned. He marched me over because I was attached to B Company, and he tells the, the fellow there, he says he was a, a captain, and he said, we've been looking for him. He was supposed to be here two weeks ago. Well, he ain't coming. He's mine. So check him out. You can't have him. I needed an operator. Too bad. He's mine. So I went back, and I spent 18 months in that hole. Uh, once you get down there, the first thing to do is you get a top secret clearance. And I learned it's kind of nice. It's nice and warm, 10 feet under the ground. One thing you learn is it was all about atomic munitions. We played with atomic bombs. Two, two, we can, that you can, we, we can still talk about that kind of stuff because I looked it up and in 1975 when Vietnam was done, they just banned the whole thing. And in the time you learn, there was 13 teams, uh, four to five members in Germany, and there was 10 teams in the United States with four to five members in each team. That's all there was in the, in the whole service. We learned how to set these off. We went in the field a few times. We learned that if there was a war, we did not do anything with the United States or anybody. We did everything with the Germans. And I told you earlier, this was Hitler's old barracks, so they were built in a square. And the middle was called the quad. And a couple days they cleaned out, that's where they kept all the deuce and a half, stuff like this. It was all cleaned out. And one night about 2 o'clock in the morning, the alarms went off, because we had our own floor in the barracks. And the alarms went off, and we packed, and some E6 come and said, we don't know if this is for real, or if it's training. So put your helmets on and get outside. We got outside and each team had their own helicopter. We got in it, they flew us to the depot where these things were under the ground and it was spraying. You walked in, it was lit up and everything was red on one side and the other side was all green. As soon as they opened the doors, the red lights all went out. So that told our our captain and our our our, our E seven that we're going to play war games. And that was the time that they brought them. I think they brought like fifteen or twenty thousand troops over to Germany from the United States, and we were entangled with that. We, uh, we loaded up all the trainers, got on, and away we went. We had no idea where we were going. There was a big camp out in the middle of nowhere. We set up posts. We stayed there. But we were with the Germans, so the Germans knew where to go. So, so there was, uh, we, let's put it, we had 12 days of just pretty much fun. Uh, each team was picked, and we'd go out and we'd blow something up. And it wasn't, we had a bomb that you could strap to yourself, to bought an airplane with, go set it up, and it was, you picked this mountain up and you set it over here on top of a road or on top of a multitude of roads. It wasn't like Hiroshima where we blew up people with these. This was an atomic bomb though. Yeah. It was a dumb bomb. And it just picks them up and moves them over and sets them down. It was, they, they teach you all that, how to drill, how to get it right where we are you need it. They said in case of a war, each team had three, three objectives, and out of them three, you'll get two done, and hopefully you get all three. So we played them games. We did that twice while I was there. Uh, another time is they said we're going to go for a training, and we're going to show you how to jump out of an airplane with this. Any time we were alone or we were down in the hall, there's no rank. We used to get up to upwards of 10, 12 inspections a year. 
that come out of the Pentagon, the minimum of three times. Um, the second nav would come out once or twice a year. The seventh corps would come, and I, there was one more that used to come, but I forget. But there was never any rank. When they come out of the Pentagon, they were all um, full birds or one-star generals that come. And they were from all branches of the service. But when they got down there, I mean, you still got to respect. You didn't say, hey, you, you, you know, sir, would you do this? Because we had a, uh, I did, but uh, somebody on my team, he got up while we were setting this up, and your inspector was going to walk, and the guy told me, you, you go sit down. He said, I'm inspecting, no, sit down. You, got, you can't get close to this. So I, there, that's, that was one rule that was kind of nice. I mean, you still got to respect. I mean, we weren't the the dumbest bunch of people in the world, so, you, you know, you learn, call common sense. So, they said, you know, I, I had a nickname in service, they called me Rip, because nobody could say Repel. <laughs> so they said, Rip, you come and stand here, and we're going to strap this on you. Now, we're in this airplane, and we're up in the air, and we're flying around. And they said, the first thing you do is, here's your compass. So they give me my compass, and then they give me a forty-five pistol. Then they come with this contraption and they strap me in this thing and they say, now we're going to put the parachute on you. The parachute's all packed. So they strapped it on and they said, well, we tether you on up here, Puck. When you jump out, you're going to feel a big jar and the parachute should open. If it don't open, because now you've cut away from the plane, you pull this cord. If that don't open, you reach down here on both sides and you open this up and it should come out. So I'm feeling, I get around, I'm getting this done. This, this is your first jump you've never jumped? No, 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 but we're no going training. to be training. There's huh? no training and that's, and so there's, I never jump. So, here we are, and they said, okay, now you got this down, Rip? I said, yep. Okay. They bring over the bomb. And said, you know, I'm not jumping out of this. Only an idiot jumps out of a perfectly good airplane. Yes, they brought a little laughter, but no, but they, they weren't laughing, just me. So I said, they, they strapped this to me. Now, we knew the exact dimensions, and this bomb comes with a, uh, I'll never read it, it comes with a 29-foot, 3 and 3 eighths inch rope. That's hooked to it. So when you get close to the ground, you pull this, this bomb lets loose in this canister, and you lower it down so it don't hit the ground. Okay. So I start, I'm going, no, no, it's not that. You're going to jump out here. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm jumping out of an airplane. You can't make me jump out of an airplane because I never jumped out of an airplane. I don't have jump training. We watch you. You don't need jump training. Yeah, yeah, I do. And I look out and I said, you know, there's no, uh, there's no windows, but I can tell we're up in here because we've been flying quite a while. All of a sudden, this door opens up and they said, Rip, now when this light turns green, you jump out. I, no, <laughs> I'm not jumping out of this airplane. So I said, Sergeant David and Sergeant Smith grabbed me and they basically threw my ass right out of the airplane. Now, screaming and hollering, but it was pretty much because I'm grabbing for every button I can. All of a sudden, that hit, and this big old chute opens up, and I'm still screaming. Because <laughs> I can't see people on the ground, so I want really high. <laughs> and I, you this know, I laugh. This laugh. is daytime, right? It is daytime. Okay. And I said, I, you know, I laugh now, but at the time, it was not funny at all. I thought I was going to have to go home and change my drawers. It was a bad deal to me on airplane. So uh, when I got close to the ground, you're supposed to lower this. So that's what I did. I pulled the thing and it dropped. Make sure it got to the ground for me. When I hit, I rolled, and yes, I rolled up my stuff. I had to go find my bomb because I lost my bomb. <laughs> so I found my bomb, got out my compass. I had to walk about a mile, but I got to where I was supposed to be, and I pulled it out, and I got it set up, and here they showed up. And they were very happy. I was not a happy camper. 
But I did that twice. The second time I jumped. I, it don't get any easier. I was still scared. Did you get jump pay for this? No. No. They told me, you'll get a, a, a pin when you graduate. Oh, okay. Yeah, I ain't got a damn pin. But uh, I don't know if I'd do that today. I don't think they can do that to you today. But back then, they didn't care. What are you going to do? You're a GI. You're a government issue. Get out. But... Uh, we did that. You, you, we made great. I mean, within six months, I went from an E1, E2 to an E5. I was pick five I was for about 15, 16 months. So you made great really fast when I was overseas. I didn't mind Germany. Uh, How long called, were you there? 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. So I was in about 22 months, 21 months, something like that. I got home in April, so whatever it works out to. But um, I got home in time to, to farm. And that's basically the story. I mean, uh, people were calling my folks because to get that uh, top uh, security clearance, top secret clearance, they got to check out your background. So they were all over Argyll. Now, can you imagine? People walking around Argyll asking, like, Mel Ethier or, or these people, uh, do you know Jack Rebell? Yes, they knew Jack Rebell. <laughs> and did you get a top secret clearance knowing who you are? Yes. Yes, I had it. I had one. Well, I don't mind. I got it now. One of, the, one of the highlights of my trip over there is when um, I got drafted again. Uh, it's a little different story. That's uh, when I was born. My folks wanted to name me Jack, and the priest wouldn't call me Jack. They, he would only baptize me John. So everything in my life was Jack, except my birth certificate that had John Jack with the rest of my names on it. So I'm over there, and a letter comes to John Reapel. So I opened it, and I only got like three or four months left, and I'm drafted again as John Rebell. So I went to the CEO, and I said, I got a call. I got a call now. <laughs> You've had me now for two years. I'm not coming back for another two years. So they had to go to the lawyer and make sure the same person was there. You know, it's a little different when you get in that service part. But you know, there was different things. I mean, we did all kinds of things. It was it was an experience. I wanted to trade it in. I didn't mind the service. Did you enjoy Germany? I did. We did a lot of things in Germany. Uh, I really did. It was it was fine. I didn't. It's a job. It's what you want to put into it. I know I couldn't stay there forever, but once you make rank, you're going to go up. Anybody knows that. So it was pretty easy. I would have, if, uh, if I could have farmed, my plan was, they wanted to make me a helicopter pilot right out of basic. And I thought that would have been great because that, uh, that was 52 weeks. The guy says, we want to send you to Texas to be a, a helicopter pilot. Jesus said, I'd really like that. They say what kind of helicopter? No, they said helicopter pilot. I said, that would be great because I'm thinking in my head, 52 weeks is a year. I've been here for two months, that's 14 months. So I can't be in Vietnam that long. But now there's a little it's a small print at the bottom. You're, you're signing up for one extra year here. I said, you know, I, I'm sorry, but you got me for two years. You don't have me for three or four years. The one time I really got, I, well, I got, I actually got scared. I, um, I had two months left, no, I had about, about three months because uh, <clears throat> I got orders to go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I took him to, he was a good friend, he was, he, he was the E7 in this outfit, and him and his wife basically took me under, they had kids my age. He'd been there 37 years, and he'd been to Vietnam twice or three times, and I asked old David, I said, you know, what is this? Well, they're going to make you a mole. 
And I said, what, what, what do you mean a mole? Well, he says, the Viet Cong dig these tunnels. And he says, what they do is, they go out and they find them. They send a dog into them. Dog comes out. You go in. You got top secret clearance. You know how to use C4. You know how to use C2. Deck cord. You know how to do all that stuff. So then you blow, blow it up. The only bad thing is, if they can't know who you are, well, how do they know who I am? Well, they don't usually give you a gun. You got your 45, because you're an E5, you'll make E6 as soon as you hit in country. So you're going to have some say, but you don't want no say, because you don't know nothing. You want some guy who's been there for 10, 12 months, he teach you around, and he says, um, <clears throat> The point guy is going to stay at least 100 to 150 feet ahead of you, and the rest of the guys are going to stay 100 100 feet because the snipers know who you are because you carry just this pack on your back, so they shoot at that pack. So he says, Rip, I hate to tell you, but you could die. Oh, that made you feel good. So I said, don't I get treated? Oh, yeah, he's here. We're going to send you to, uh, to Stuttgart, a little out of ways out of Stuttgart, and you're going to take jungle training. How can you teach me jungle training in, in, in Germany? Well, needless to say, it's a little colder, but you're in mud, you're in the water, they spray you all day, you're soft and wet, and you're in mud up to your knees and your ankles, you're always wet. And they train you, and I learned how to crawl in, how to set these. I was just about done, I remember I was in the mud, and I felt like crying because I was really tired of the mud. And some dude comes up and he hollers, is there, a, they can't never say my name. And he hollers, that's got to be me. I'm here. Here's your papers. What? You're going back to Heilbronn, to ADM. I went back to Atomic Demolition Munitions, and sure enough, I was going home. I only had six weeks left, and they were sending me home. <laughs> I was very excited. <laughs> and, say the least. Yeah. And that was about it, I guess. That's what I did in the service. When you got home, uh, how'd that go? It when, was, when you came when you came back to Argyle, I mean, how were you welcomed? Were you welcomed home? I was really welcomed in Argyle. Uh, I landed in Dix, and they tell you, you know, you put on your dress greens and they, now they stand you in front and they give you all these ribbons that you did, and you're roped, all this good stuff. And you put it on your uniform, you should be proud as a peacock. They put you on a boat or on a, on a bus and they're going to take you to the airport. You need a class A's to fly. Yeah. Hit the airport and we didn't know what was going on. But you got to remember in, in 1971, we were about at the peak. And they, the, the, the love people were really, they were throwing stuff at our bus, and we got out, they were calling us baby killers, and they were throwing junk at us and spitting at us, and we got in there, and the first place I had it was the bathroom. And I ripped the, the, my E5 patches off, got off the uniform, put on my fatigues, put on a baseball cap, took everything off, and headed for, for the airplane. <laughs> And that's how I come home. I was not traveling. That they hated us. Yep. I, I just couldn't believe it. They didn't like us at all. They didn't even know us. And when I landed in the cities, because then I flew to the cities, then from there I flew into Grand Forks. But in the cities, it was no better. There they were even in the terminal. They let them in the terminal, and they, it was not nice. What month in, in uh, April I come home? That was April? Yeah. Yeah, because I came through there 71 in August. It was the same way. Same way. Yeah, they were not nice. You were in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, go ahead, Jack. Finish up. I guess that's about it. I was, I was really happy to, to see the farm. We, I, I've stayed in touch with a lot of my buddies. Uh, we still do Christmas cards after 50 years. We still we talk on the phone once in a while. Yeah. But nothing real traumatic. I never saved a whole bunch of Well, it sounds like you had a good experience. We so, did. I so. wouldn't trade it. To me, in this day and age, it should be 
the draft should still be there. A lot of these kids, in my own mind, could use that. You grow up fast. Mm -hmm. You don't have mom and dad to hold your hand no more. You take care of yourself. <laughs> but we don't. So, but yeah, it's going to do it again. Well, thank you, Jack. Thank you. That was uh, quite the story. Yeah, it's a story. Can't wait to talk to your dad. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs>